So good morning. It's good, good to morning. see you here this morning. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles with me to Malachi. Ooh, Malachi. It's the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi. We're looking at verse, I mean chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. We're kicking off our new Bible study year, so we will be um, commissioning our teachers at the end of the message. So I wanted to focus on a message for our teachers. And you're just going to have to stick with me a little bit to understand the title there. But as all of us know, or you have been definitely in the dark, we have been affected this last uh, year and a half with COVID. We have been taught a lot of things that have changed our lives. If you just look around... We didn't used to wear masks to church. This is something new for us, but it's become a habit. We were at the zoo last week, and there was a father with two preschool kids, and they were sitting down at the bench next to us. We were eating our lunch. They were eating theirs, and as soon as they finished eating, both kids automatically just pulled their mask up over their face. The little girl forgot her toy on the bench, but she remembered her mask. It's become so much a habit. We have been taught that this is important to keep us safe. We've been taught all other things, and we've kind of changed our life because we believe these teachings. Uh, we don't shake hands anymore. We kind of have a distance. Here in Davis, you, you will see people kind of, you know, shunning you like you have the plague. Um, we have accepted these teachings as truth, and we have changed the way we live. And I'm not here to argue the correctness of that but my point is that if we can do that as a nation, as a world, actually, why can't we do that with the truth of God's word? There are arguments and debates to the science of, of COVID. And yes, there's debates about the truth of God's word. But we have a tested truth in God's word. And yet we still don't obey it. And it ought to have the same effect around the entire world if we're teaching the truth. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. So this is a message. Malachi is addressing the priest. Uh, he's not very happy with them. They've already gotten a shakedown in chapter 1. And now he's focusing on them as teachers. One of the responsibilities of priests were to teach the word of God. So remembering that as we start in verse 1. And God's word reads. Oh, sorry. I forgot all about this. This was, you may not have seen these yet. These are touchless keys to help during COVID. They were invented. You can do the ATM or other things. You can do an elevator button. You can even open the door. You can even flush the toilet without touching it with this key. But <laughs> what I'm wondering, but you still have to touch the key and it goes back in your pocket or somewhere else after it's touched all these things. So anyway, uh, I'm not selling them, but our whole world has changed. Inventions have fit around this new norm or new truth that's being taught in our world. So now let's look at how the Word of God should be similarly affecting our world. So verse 1, And now this admonition is for you, O priest, if you do not listen and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread on your faces the awful from the festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this admonition so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from sin. For the lips of the priests 
ought to preserve knowledge. And from his mouth, men should seek instruction because he is a messenger of the Lord Almighty. But you have turned from the way and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Heavenly Father, some very difficult words when today we're wanting to encourage our teachers. But help us this morning to hear these words of admonition and may they turn to encouragement of what you want from our teachers from those that are leading others to understand the word of God, but also to hear the message that's here for the students as well. So give us that understanding this morning, an understanding that turns our life around. Amen. So what was God's complaint about these priests? What was he uh, worried about? What was he condemning them for? Well, first off, he says they're not listening. They're teaching the word of God, but they're not even listening. Can you imagine that you're teaching and you're kind of in this daydream and you're not even paying attention to what you're teaching? Well, sometimes we teach the word of God so many times. If you've been a teacher for years, you kind of know this truth. So you don't stop and think about it. You can talk about it without being involved. I don't know, Juan, as a school teacher, do you sometimes find yourself teaching some music theory or something and not really thinking about it because you know it so well? It's a bad habit. It's a bad habit. Yeah, and I think it would be, and it's not to, to pick on Juan, but it's true of all teachers. When you know your stuff very well, you can easily teach it without thinking about it. And that's okay if it is just a factual subject. Long as you're teaching the truth, you're giving them the truth about that science or music or whatever you're teaching, that's okay. But when it comes to the word of God, it's not meant to just be learned by facts. It's meant to be lived. So he is condemning the priests because they're not even listening to what they're teaching. Then he says they don't set their hearts to honor God. Well, how do I set my heart to honor God? I live his word. I obey what he's saying because by that I show it's important. If I'm not living the word of God, then I'm saying to him, what you teach is not important. I just want to learn some facts. I want to know the things so I can impress somebody by giving an answer, pass a test in Bible class. That's not honoring God. If I honor God, then I'm saying, yes, I trust you. We, quote unquote, honor God the CDC and physicians who tell us what we're supposed to do by obeying. If we disobey that, we're saying, I don't trust you. I don't believe what you're saying. And that's happening around America. Some are believing, some are not. And that's the basis of it. I don't trust your message. I don't trust the government. Well, we don't get so upset when people don't trust the government. We also don't seem to get very upset when people don't trust God because it's just become a habit, a part of our culture, not to trust his authority. But he is the Lord Almighty. Have you noticed that name that Malachi kept using for him? He says, you don't honor me with your hearts by the way you live in obedience. Then if you skip down to verse 8, it says, and you've turned from obeying my word. So it's not that they're not teaching the truth, they're just not living the truth. It says, you have turned from obeying my word, and you've also turned others. You've caused them to stumble. Got a teacher that says, do what I say, not what I do. (laughs) That doesn't work for a Bible teacher. People are not going to get excited. They're not going to obey the word of God if they don't see you as the teacher obeying and living and being excited about the life change within the word of God. Look at Luke 6, 46. Jesus confronts some of the teachers. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? We have Bible study teachers who will teach that Jesus is the Lord, our Savior, but they don't live that way. 
And Jesus is confronting us, my friends. If you are teaching the word of God, you need to be teaching more than just facts. You need to be living it. It needs to show in your choices, in your attitude, in the way you behave. Amen. Look at Titus 1.16. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. What's wrong with these teachers? They're not obeying God. And he says, they're detestable. This is in God's eyes. He wants our Bible study teachers, our pastors, every one of his children to show the importance, the worth of God's word by living by it. People ought to see. I mean, you can kind of, well, not, I'm about to get too political there, so put that off. But yeah, you can see by our actions what we believe, right? And that's what God is saying. Why should your students get excited about coming to Bible study when it, they're just sitting there and learn, learning a bunch of facts and some of them, they already know these things. If you're not excited about how God's word is affecting your life, how can you expect your students to get excited? And how is God going to respond? <laughs> he says he's going to curse you. Mm. This is not just some simple, okay, I'm going to punish you. He's going to curse you. He says, I'm going to curse your blessings. Those things I've blessed you with in the past, I'm cursing them because you're not honoring me. You're not obeying me. You're not respecting me. And look in verse 3. It says he's going to put the awful on your face. And that doesn't mean he's just going to make you look ugly. Do you know what awful is? Yeah? John? It's the things out of the intestines of a sacrificed animal. In other words, to put it very bluntly, it's the poop that didn't get pooped. That's what God is going to smear on your face. Oh my, yeah, ugh. So the idea here is God is going to shame you for your disobedience. And then it says you're going to be carried off because what would happen is they would take those parts of the sacrificed animals and because they were unclean, they would be carried out of the city and be burned. He's saying, you have no value to me. I'm going to carry you off with a dung. That's, a, well, that's an insult, but that's coming from our God. That's his feelings if we teach the Bible and we're not living it. If it's not affecting our lives, or as you, if you haven't picked up yet, if it hasn't turned our life around. For those of you who know the song. And he says, I'm going to rebuke your descendants. Our obedience or our disobedience affects our children. Do your children look at you and go, oh, yeah, it's church time again. It's what we do as a family, but no one's excited. Have a, a short little skit that I wrote, and it's about a family coming home from church, and they're complaining about somebody's perfume smelling bad, how long the preacher preached, that the music was off, and they're just complaining about everything, the dad, the mom, and the teenage daughter. And then the little kid pipes up and says, well, Dad, I thought it was a pretty good show for the dollar you paid. <laughs> yeah. What are we teaching our children? What attitude about the word of God? Do they see a hunger? I remember my great-grandfather who didn't even finish, I think, fifth grade. His reading level was not that high. But I remember after working very hard out in the field, he would come and sit in the corner and in the winter by the potbelly stove. And he would read his Bible, his King James Bible, which was not easy to understand for him. But he had a love for the word of God. And even though he was tired, he was going to have to wake up early the next morning, he did not go to sleep without spending some time in the Word of God. He valued it. That's one of my pictures I have of my great-grandpa that is very precious to me, is seeing his love for the Word of God. What are we teaching our children? What do they see? Is it something we're just forcing on them? We're pointing out all their mistakes. We throw the word of God in their face as a punishment or a threat. 
Or do they see us in love with God and obeying him? Let's move on to verse 5 through 7. How should God's priests teach? Well, he says this is a covenant of life and peace. It's an agreement between man and God. When he's called you to teach, it is a covenant of peace and life. You see, if I'm obeying God, I have that abundant life. I have that joy. I have that peace with God. I don't have guilt. I don't have fear. There's no worry. And this is that covenant he has with Levi. He said, if you teach the word of God, everything's going to be just fine. If you live the word of God, your life is going to be wonderful. Then he goes on to say, they reverence me. They have an awe about God. If you spend time with God and his word, and not just to learn facts, but you're spending time to meet with him, you're going to stand in awe of who he is, what he does. What a wonderful, loving, and grace-filled God. I'm very thankful that God is God. Because I would not be here without him. He is so filled with grace. So many second chances. I have no right to stand here to be his spokesperson. But he is a God of grace. And I stand in awe at that alone. That he would allow me to serve him. But he goes on to say, they walk with God. He says, he walks with me in peace and uprightness. A teacher of the word of God needs to be walking with God, not just full of knowledge and facts. I had a guy that lived next to me in my dorm, my my freshman year of college. He was the son of a rabbi, and he knew the Bible. Wow, would he get in arguments with me. He would present me with all these things, and I would just be lost. I would go home on the weekend and ask my uh, my pastor, can you help me? Can you help me? I don't know how to respond. He knew the Bible very well, the facts, but he did not know Jesus Christ. He had never met the almighty God of the Bible, and his life was empty and bitter. A Bible study teacher needs to be walking with God. They need to have that fellowship with him. They're not just sharing knowledge they've learned out of of a book. They're sharing about an experience with God. They've been meeting with him daily throughout the week. So when they arrive to teach that Bible study class, they're sharing what's happened with them that week. What God has taught them, how he has touched their heart, how their life has changed or turned around, if you're getting the song, Then it says, they have also turned many from their sin. Now, this doesn't mean they are acting like the Holy Spirit. They're not the one doing the convicting, but they're teaching the truth of the word of God. But they're also living it. So people see there is a difference when I commit to the word of God. Look at the peace. Look at the joy. Look at the victory in that person's life. And yeah, some people aren't going to like us. When we stand up for what is right, when we're living the word of God, we confront them whether we want to or not. So I'm not saying that priests are the Holy Spirit, but by our very life and example, we confront people. The Holy Spirit works on their heart and we'll see people turning their life around. If you're hearing the song yet. okay. And it says they teach true instruction. They're teaching the truth, the word of God. Nothing false comes from their lips. It's not for their own gain. See, what he's confronting here is that the priest would change things to be popular with the people. They would teach only what people wanted to hear. Look at Acts 20, 27. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. I work very hard not to skip parts of the Bible that are difficult when I'm planning out my messages for the year. I do that ahead of time, so I'm not tempted to pick only the easy ones or the popular verses. We need to teach the entire word of God. What impact will this have on the students? We've already seen they will turn from their sins. 
But what else do they see? They'll, they'll seek instruction, it says. They're going to want to know. They're going to want to learn from you. Because they see the word of God has made a difference in your life. And their life will be transformed. And yes, their life will turn around or repent. There is a change that happens when you sit under true Bible study teaching, when you allow the word of God to affect your heart. Look at 1 Corinthians 6.11. 1 Corinthians 6.11. In verses 9 and 10, he's listing all of these sins. And he says then, and that is what some of you were. W-E-R is past tense. It means not anymore. It means you listened to the word of God and it convicted your heart and you turned your life around. You were, excuse me, were in these sins, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Your life has been changed. If you're in the word of God, my friends, it cannot not affect you. If you're listening to God, you're fellowshipping with God. Matthew 3, 8 that we read earlier says, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. If I've turned my life around, you're going to see a difference in how I live. Look at James 3, 1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that those who teach will be judged more strictly. Ugh. That's not very comforting. But all it means is not, oh, I've got to be this perfect theologian. It is, are you living the word of God? Are you allowing it to touch your hearts? Is it turning your life around? That's all that he's saying. So let me ask you these questions. When you teach the word of God, you need to ask this at the end of class. Did I help anyone meet God today? Not did they learn some interesting facts about the Bible. They learned the root word in Greek. But did they meet God? Did we have fellowship with God today in class? And then the second question would be, what impact did this meeting with God have on our lives? Have I turned my life around in any area? Have I changed my attitude, my thinking, my behavior in any way because I met with God today. Heavenly Father, give us a hunger, not just to spend time learning the truths, but meeting the God of truth and allowing you to touch and penetrate our hearts to where we do listen and honor you with our lives through obedience. We allow your word to turn our life around. So we're living in obedience to you. We're walking in fellowship with you. And people see the difference you make in our life. And they seek the word of God. They seek to know you. And then we can truly be teachers of the word of God. In your name we pray. Amen. So the challenge is pretty simple. Be sure as a teacher, you're allowing God to meet with you and touch your heart. Then as you're teaching, be sure you're introducing people to the God of the word and allowing him to change their hearts. So at this time, after that wonderful, comforting message, all of you who teach in this church, would you come to the front and just line up? We want to have a time of praying over you because you've got a big challenge, a big um, responsibility. So if you teach either on Sunday morning or throughout the week, if you could just stand here in the front, please. We want to have a prayer of blessing over you with this challenge. Okay. You'll just stand in the front and face the congregation. I'm going to ask you to join me in praying for our teachers. They have accepted this huge responsibility. They did not take it lightly. This is not an easy task. Satan is going to try to discourage them. He's going to try to make Sunday mornings the worst day of the week. 
They are going to be under attack. I can tell you that. We as a church family need to love and understand and appreciate what they have volunteered to do. And we need to be in prayer for them, not just today, but every week praying for them that they can bring us to the throne of God and that we would open up our hearts to let him turn our life around. So would you join me as we pray for our teachers, please? Heavenly Father, I pray first off, after hearing this message, it's pretty scary to think we've accepted that responsibility to teach. It doesn't mean to be scary. It just means we need to wake up and understand our responsibility, but that you want to meet with us. You're a God of grace that will meet with us, that will touch our hearts, that will cleanse our heart and will help us to turn our life around, to have fellowship with you, to walk in obedience with you, to honor you with our hearts. Help us, Heavenly Father to be those teachers who have spent the week meeting with you, fellowshiping with you, studying and, and examining your word so we can know you better, not just the truths and the history and the culture and the meaning of the words, but so we can know you and hear what you want from us. And then when we sit down to teach that class on Sunday or throughout the week, whenever it is, we are ready to share our experience of a changed heart. We are ready to make sure our students meet the same God that we've been meeting throughout the week. And use us then, Father, to turn many from their sin, to turn many into that intimate relationship with you. Use our teachers to make a difference in the lives of all that hear. In your name we pray. Amen. We want to have hokey pokey teaching that turns our life around. That's the whole idea. So if God is speaking to you this morning and you realize you've not had that correct attitude about the word of God, of meeting and studying for the sole purpose of letting him touch your heart and turn your life around. Maybe you just want somebody to pray with you. Maybe you've never met him as your savior and you're recognizing that. If you need prayer, that's what we're here for. This invitation is for you to come and know you have a family that loves and supports you. Uh, so as we sing, if you want somebody to pray with you, would you just come to the front, please? Thursday night, a group of us from our church went to the Spiro Banquet to learn more about this ministry. This is a ministry that we support in our church family with a percentage of our monthly giving. This ministry exists to promote the sanctity of all human life and to help families make a choice for life. Working with men and women, helping out and getting medical care and things they may need, but to help them to choose and to understand the benefit of that choice of life. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of their ministries is a post-abortion uh, recovery group. The medical world and planned parenthood does not tell women the pain of taking the life of their child. I cannot tell you how many women have come to my office for counseling and dealing with that guilt and that self-hatred when they've realized what they have done. God is a God of forgiveness. But wouldn't it be better if we didn't need that forgiveness? Wouldn't it be better if these children could still be alive, being a blessing and an addition to the world around us? So this ministry helps to encourage that life, not in a judgmental way. Because if, if a woman has already chose that or a father has already encouraged that, there is that opportunity to find forgiveness and reconciliation. But one of the things we learned about at this banquet that I did not know is many of you, you may have forgotten now because it's been a part of our lives for so long, but the RU486, which is an abortion medication, so that no longer you need to have a surgical procedure to take the life of that baby out of you. This medicine basically starves that child to death, so they die within the woman. There is now medicine that can reverse that. If a lady takes that pill and then decides 
that she made a mistake, that she wants to keep her child alive, there is medicine that can be given to reverse that. The medical world doesn't want ladies to know that. Matter of fact, Planned Parenthood will tell you that once you take the first pill, there's no going back. So we just want to make sure that ladies know they have an option. You might say God is the God of pro-choice, a choice to choose life, a choice to choose to not have to carry around that guilt of taking another life. I realize that it's legal in our nation, but I also know that these are precious lives. And it affects so many. Because not only is that child's life taken from them, but that mom has to carry that guilt with her. That dad has to carry that guilt. The family missing that child and thinking about it and seeing a child that would be about that same age. This ministry is about redemption. And we want to pray for them. On the 29th of this month, they're going to have an inspection for their medical license. The first time they applied, it was just denied right out. This time, they have made the first process uh, in that application process. And so they're going to have an inspection of the facilities. And from what I understand, the inspector is very uh, pro-abortion. So it's going to be difficult, but we just need to pray that God will touch your heart to understand that this is a ministry of love and grace so that they could be approved. This would mean so much of the services they could give to these women when they come. They already have the medical staff and volunteers, but they need that license to be able to provide more services to the women coming to them for help. So would you join me as we pray for this ministry of redemption and grace? Heavenly Father, sometimes a pregnancy is just not an easy thing for women. We don't always know the situations of what caused the pregnancy or the impact that it would have on that woman. And so they need support and love, not condemnation, not judgment, but support for people that are willing to walk through that difficult choice with them, to let them know they're not alone, that they're not judged, they're not condemned, and that there's people who will love on them and love on their children. So I pray that you're going to continue to bless Spiro with, with volunteers and the finances they need to be about saving lives and reconciliation with you, finding that forgiveness and that uh, restored hope. And God, we know that they could do so much more if they had their medical license. We know that you are a sovereign God. So we ask that you just bless this inspector with a wonderful day. Just soften her heart. And as she goes in, open up her eyes to see the grace and love of this ministry, that it's not an anti-woman ministry but that it's a pro-life of grace and forgiveness. And we pray that you would grant them this medical license and then bless this ministry. Thank you for allowing us to be a part as we give, as we pray, and maybe even volunteer. Thank you for every life that was saved through this ministry. Amen. Hunt's going to come now and close our service in song and prayer. And as God leads you to be a part of what God is doing through this church, would you just give in one of the offering bu buckets? Our coin jar this month is Bibles for the Blind. And if you've ever seen Jane bring her Bible, they are huge books. Because you think that Braille that's got to be typed into that very thick paper. So they are very expensive. But it's amazing to see her just light up as her fingers are going across that braille as she's reading the word of God. And just think about helping somebody to be able to hear the word of God as they receive a Bible in braille for them to be able to read. So as God lays it on your heart to give to that ministry, would you put that in our coin jar on your way out? What?